What's up? This is Ray. Welcome back. Hey, we got a very interesting episode today. We're going to be doing a kind of science experiment with photography. This is something I've been working on for weeks. Um, what I'm going to show you is in camera cyanotype and a quick history lesson. What is a cyanotype? It, it was invented in about 1842, if I remember correctly. And the way it works is you coat paper with a light sensitive chemical. Um, you place any object you want on that paper and leave it out in the sun. Um, the ultraviolet rays of the sun will react with the chemical and turn it this brilliant blue. It's very beautiful. Um, before you're finished, you do rinse the paper, rinse off all of that chemical, and in time, as it dries, the blue will become even more brilliant. Um, it's a color that uh, you kind of have to see in person to, to appreciate. But I always wondered, if this is light sensitive, why is no one putting it in a camera? Um, so I did some Google research and I found that very, there's a few people who tried it with not so good results and I wanted to know why. So uh, this is, that's what this episode is about. My experiments with in-camera cyanotypes, um, my results and why it is difficult. What are the limitations of it and why more people do not try it. But um, based on the results I got, I think it's worth it if you are interested though. So uh, stick around. We're going to be checking out in-camera cyanotypes in medium format. Stick around. Okay, so before we talk about the mechanics and how to work with the paper and, and deal with it, I want to show you the first image I, I made with it. Um, this image you're looking at is one I took from my backyard aiming at the sunset. Um, the reason I chose aiming it at the sunset is because from, what I, from my research, the ultraviolet entering the camera the camera has several lens elements and by the time the sunlight reaches the the cyanotype there's very little ultraviolet to activate it so I decided to make this a 20 minute exposure um, and but what you're going to notice is look at the top of the image you see that what looks like a burn that's the sun the sun was moving throughout the sky um, and as you can see it, it kind of burned the paper it didn't burn straight through um, so one thing I learned about that is you can make an image in a camera like this and I, and I was you don't see a lot of detail in this image but I was amazed I was really fired up when I saw that and it made me want to try more so yeah so that was the first image I learned some things from it um, let's move on okay so the next thing I want to show you is kind of my most technically perfect image uh, and by the way I just switched up a cyanotype here I, sh I should have been doing them more for each chapter just to, for variety but what I'm going to show you now is an image of a windmill it's like only two windmills in, in my area um, and I always wanted to get one so I'm going to show you the setup now for this particular image I'll check it out okay so here's the setup this is the silhouette I'm gonna leave this for maybe 15 minutes and see what happens backlit images like this usually don't need to stay for an hour and so as would you need for a side uh, image so uh, yeah I'm really curious how this one's gonna come out I like the way it's looking so far. Um, should be beautiful. So yeah, what the reason I say this is kind of the most technically perfect image is because I prepared for it. I was ready. Um, the sun was nice and bright. There were no clouds blocking it. Um, the sun was behind the windmill, so it didn't burn the paper. Uh, my focus was perfect. You can see that it's, it's sharp. Um, and most importantly, the windmill was not spinning. Uh, so we can see the blades nice and sharp and, and kind of the sun peeking through them. Uh, if, if the blades were spinning, of course, it would all be one big blur. Um, but if you notice, of course, if you look at the ground, there's no detail in the ground. This is like a, a, a perfect example of a silhouette. Um, so what makes this thing tricky is if you're into doing silhouettes, there's not a lot of options. You, you're constantly looking for things up high that you can sit in the shadow of. And if you live in a, a big city or type of area like that, there's, there's even less options. But that kind of forces you to be more creative at the same time. That's one thing to keep in mind. Okay, so next thing I want to show you is kind of how I treat the paper. I'll show you some more images after this, but this part is important. The first thing I want to say is when you coat the paper, some people use a sponge. Most people use a sponge. Um, I prefer to use a small brush. The reason why I found when I dip the sponge in the chemical it soaks up a bunch of the chemical much more than I need and it kind of goes to waste so um, I usually use a small brush but use what's best for you next thing I found is I started coating it thick really thick um, 
and I'll dry it and then coat some more because I figured the more light sensitive material the better the image. <laughs> Turns out that was wrong. What I found is when I make it too thick or if there's puddles on the paper it's like the sun doesn't penetrate those puddles or the, the thicker areas. Um, so I found that putting on as thin a layer as possible um, is better for this type of thing in, in my opinion. And what I do is I use a blow dryer to dry it and I may do make five of these and put them in a little case and put it in my camera bag and use it for the day. But one thing I found is if you try to keep this for days and days it will slowly get darker. I'm going to show you one now that I had in my camera bag for three days and when I took it out I'm shocked how tarnished it, it was, how much darker it is. So it's best to use these, create these right before you're going to be using them you're going to get best results. It's going to be a clearer and um, you're going to get more contrast in the image that way. Okay, so as far as gear is concerned, I'm using a rolly cord. You don't need a, a kind of higher end camera like this. Um, you don't need to go this, this big. You can get a medium format camera for under $100. But there's, there's some two important features that that camera needs to have. Um, it needs to have a multiple exposure switch. The reason why is some cameras will not allow you to fire the shutter when it realizes there's no film in it. So by having a multi-exposure switch, you can cock the shutter and fire it as many times as you need. Um, the next thing you're going to need is a cable release socket because what you're going to do is you're going to put the shutter in bulb mode and that way when you cock the shutter your cable release is going to have a locking knob on it so when you close it the shutter stays open as long as that cable release is locked. That way you can do a 15 minute or an hour exposure and walk away without having to hold your hand on the shutter <laughs> to keep it open. So whatever camera you get just make sure it has those two features. Alright so check this out. This is the major limitation you're going to have when you're trying to do an in-camera cyanotype is when the sunlight is coming directly into the lens that's good. It, it activates fast. You can do a even less than a 15 minute exposure and get a great result. But if you're trying to take a photo of something with the sun behind you or to the side of you the ultraviolet light is reflecting off the subject and then coming into the camera and it's much more reduced. So if you try to take an image 15 minute uh, exposure with something like that, when you look at the paper it's going to be it's going to be almost nothing there to, to make out. Um, I'm going to show you the best um, image that I was able to take with the sun not in the frame, with the sun behind me. Um, look at this neighborhood shot. Um, I think I left this out in my, on my front porch for about a little over an hour. You can st there's, there's not a lot of detail in the shadows but there's something about this image that I just really love it. Yeah, I don't know if it's the trees framing the house or what but what I love about this is it shows that you don't need super detail. I, you could take the same image with a digital camera and it, for me it just wouldn't be interesting. But looking at it on this cyanotype it's just there's a mood to it. There's something beautiful about it that words can't explain and that's what makes me keep trying to to use this to process. I want to see how how many beautiful images I can make out of just mundane things. Um, so yeah next thing I want to show you is uh, an image one of my favorite images that was almost a mistake. This is an image of a water tower and uh, let me let me play the setup for you right now. So this is what we're doing. I always wanted to shoot a water tower. There's not many in Miami at all. <laughs> so I got to take what I can get. But the problem is you see the clouds coming in. This exposure probably will only be three minutes. So and there's no clearness in the sky coming anytime soon. So when this is done, I'm just going to have to take off. I'm curious how much of an image will form just from this here. But uh, it just shows how difficult it is to get silhouettes using in-camera cyanotype. Okay so check you see you see how um, the difficulty of this look at this image though by all accounts I could say this image is a failure. Um, it was only like a three minute exposure there's not a lot of detail um, but when I look at it <laughs> this failed image is one of my favorite it looked like something out of an Alfred Hitchcock type of movie it's so moody it looks like fog is covering this water tower. I just love it. And again, it's um, it, it's something about it that words can't explain. 
if I had taken this with my digital camera, the image would look boring. So uh, that's the thing about alternative processes um, that digital can't give you. They're just there's a beauty to it, uh, an analog, natural quality to it that that digital cannot give you. Um, so that's yeah. This is one of my favorite images, although it is a failure. <laughs> Okay, so this camera I'm using here, this is a Rolly cord and it takes six by six pictures. Um, so what I did is, of course, I cut it larger. I think I made this seven by seven. The reason is if you cut it six by six, it's going to fall right into the camera bay. You need to make it a little larger so that you can get the borders and um, the borders will hold it in place. And another good thing is the pressure plate of the camera, even though this isn't flat, the pressure plate of the camera will press down and keep it flat for your exposure. That's one important thing to keep in mind. Of course, the next thing you're going to need is the light sensitive cyanotype chemical. Um, there's two different chemicals that you mix together and once you mix them, that's when they activate and become light sensitive. Um, it lasts a long time. These two bottles, it's about $12, give or take, if I remember correctly. But I've done many sheets of paper, big sheets of paper like this. I probably did 50 so far and a bunch of these in camera and I think I ha still have maybe half left. Um, so it lasts a long time and, and honestly each time I mix a batch I kind of mix too much. I'm learning that you, have, you don't have to mix as much as you think you do. So um, yeah, so the next thing you're going to need is art paper, craft paper. After using the watercolor paper I found that I kind of like multimedia paper even more because the water paper um, has a kind of rough texture to it and that texture can take away some of the sharpness of your image. Uh, it, it, it may be a look you want. So um, good quality art paper. You can get something like this for between $10 and $12 for about 50 sheets. Okay, so before we get into the details, I want to thank the company Jacquard. Jacquard is a company that makes a lot of light sensitive products um, for artists to use. Um, I, re I reached out to Jacquard. Uh, I let them know what I'm doing, what I'm trying to experiment with. Um, with these in-camera cyanotypes and I asked them would they like to be involved and um, Jacquard was kind enough to send me several uh, different types of their products to test and experiment with and this is one of them so we got to give thanks to them um, for that and I'll put a link below of course if you're interested in getting any of those products I recommend using a medium format or larger format camera see this is this is one of the the final images that came out the camera it's kind of small right Imagine if it was 35 millimeter, how small it would be. Um, you can do it on 35 millimeter, but the bigger is definitely the better. And most of these exposures, I recommend leaving them at least 15 minutes. Um, sometimes the exposure can be over an hour, um, and you'll find that out in your testing. Next thing you're going to need is a scanner, a color scanner for your computer, because if you notice, this is a negative, just like a negative of film. So. Once you scan this, you have to invert it in your, in your editor to get the actual positive image. And then you'll, you'll tweak it, tweak the contrast and different things. So that's the other thing that's important. Okay, before I go any further, there's one important thing I forgot to mention. The difference with this cyanotype and this cyanotype is this one that we put out in the sun and, the, and it, it's been out there in direct sunlight. The image is permanently seared into it. Um, even when you rinse it, it will not come off. It's like a permanent blue. Um, it's crazy. But this in-camera cyanotype is kind of a latent image. What I mean by that is that there's a little bit of ultraviolet that is able to activate the shape of it, but it's not enough to burn the image in the paper. So when, when I rinse this, the entire image pretty much will disappear and I'm going to show you right now what that looks like. The only time the, the image will stay is if there's a sun that was in the in the frame it will actually burn the image in place right around where the sun was but the, the rest of the, the image will fade away and that's why it's so important to start with a clean sheet of paper, one that's not tarnished. Um, that way you're going to get the most contrast and when you scan it you don't see that tarnish in the image. Um, so that's something I had to point out is you cannot rinse these like uh, a traditional cyanotype. All right. So another important thing to consider is this is a this is an alternative process, right? But we have to scan this negative. Um, so doing them in camera, you, you're, it's like a analog to digital. So 
the, the point of what I'm trying to say is, since you're going to be scanning it and slightly editing it and tweaking it, um, it's open to interpretation how you edit it. And one thing that I really like to do is use complementary colors. The opposite of blue is amber. So what I'll do sometimes when I'm editing, some pictures really look better when I reverse the colors to amber. And I'm going to show you an image of, a, of my daughter's bicycle now. Um, and it looks really beautiful. Um, I got this idea from, from someone on Google who were, was doing some experiments like this. And what I forgot to mention is he wasn't getting good results in camera. So he used what it sounds like a crystal ball. And he put that inside of a, a cardboard camera that he made and he put the paper in the back. Came out with some really beautiful images. Um, haunting looking images. But he talked about inverting the colors and that's how I got the idea. Um, uh, to do that. I'll put a link to his page before. He doesn't, I think, he doesn't do much, but I learned something from him. Uh, i got to give him thanks for that. So, yeah, doing these is really open to interpretation, And um, but the good thing is, in the end, it still looks like an analog image. And ultimately, if you print this, I'm sorry, if you print your final image that's on your computer, if you print it on maybe watercolor paper or fiber paper or something, um, in the traditional cyanotype blue, you can really get a good um, final image that looks as analog as possible. All right, so that is pretty much my overview on in-camera cyanotype. I'm not an expert, I'm not a guru. I'm just a dude that loves to experiment and, and try to think outside the box. So hopefully um, what I showed you, if you're interested, maybe gives you some ideas um, to avoid some of the mistakes and pitfalls that might be annoying to you in the beginning. So uh, maybe if you can start from like the baseline that I showed, um, and I'd love to see what other people are doing also, because there's things, there's silhouettes or whatever in your area that I don't get in my area. Um, so everyone probably can really come up with different ways to use this to come up with beautiful images. Um, I don't know why I feel like I'm forgetting some important segment I should have talked about. <laughs> I say that all the time, but if you if you have any questions, definitely leave them below. Um, we want to thank Asher. I forgot his last name. The president of Jacquard. His name is Asher. He provided these equipment. Want to thank him for that. Really appreciate that. Hope this video um, benefits you in some way. Um, and of course, I'm going to put a link to their their Amazon where you can get theirs. Also, um, hey, thanks for watching this video. And keep in mind, no matter what. Process. No, what, no matter what alternative process you use, whether it's cyanotype, ambrotype, wet plate collodion, um, and the many others. Until next time, as always, keep it real.